many situations, I know that you've uh, lived through this because you are interpreter. The speaker just keeps on uh, speaking, right? And I know that you know what I mean. The speaker can go on for five, 10, 15 minutes and you cannot miss uh, a name, a number, a date, a uh, turn of style, anything about the tone, anything about the intention and about the register. Everything has to be recorded in your memory and also needs to be in some way recorded in your notes. You've all had this situation happen, I'm sure, where the speaker just keeps on going. What you're going to have to do is learn how to take notes. I know that many of you, please don't think that I'm talking down to you. I know that many of you have been interpreters for decades and have degrees in interpreting, um, but uh, I'm going to also be speaking to you as uh, learners because that's what we're here to do. So you need to be able to uh, take enough notes to remember everything and give all of these things, name, numbers, logical arguments, every color, every description. And what can happen is that you will amaze your clients. What you want is them to have you back. And what you also want is just to be a great professional. But behind all that, of course, you want to get a good income for you yourself and for your family. You want to have repeat customers, people who say, okay, she did an amazing consecutive, she got everything. She has to be in our next meeting. And you want to be able to charge the high price because you are in high demand. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself now. My name is David Violet. I am a conference interpreter and a trainer and coach in the San Francisco, California area. And I have been giving a class in classrooms about note taking and recently it's been online. And here I am with my, uh, my picture. I'm also a member of IEEC. Please stick around till the end because I do have what I consider to be a uh, precious gift. It's actually something uh, that I uh, I value very highly and it's, uh, I think that you'll like it. It's not that gold thing there, but it is actually related. And I'll tell you why it's related at the end if, uh, if you're interested. So let's take a look at why you're here and why we want to learn consecutive interpreting with notes. Can somebody uh, maybe come forward and say, why would you want to learn uh, consecutive interpreting with notes when you probably already do simultaneous and you probably already do uh you know sentence by sentence consecutive somebody have a something to say about that how about miriam what would you say uh, well there are a few reasons why you want to learn consecutive with notes one of them is that you might want to take an examination to work for an international organization and some of them require that you take a consecutive test so that might be a very good reason Another one is that you might do consecutive uh, when your clients ask you to, but you're not very happy with your delivery. And uh, so you want, to, you want to learn it properly. You want to have a method, a structure. You want to know where you're going with your notes, if that is possible. But you want to equip yourself with the best technique available. And the third reason I would mention is that it gives you a competitive edge. Not everybody knows how to do a good consecutive. And some colleagues might refuse contracts, especially if they have to go on stage or they have to perform a consecutive interpreting in front of a wider audience and not just with some customers they're comfortable with. So I, these were, would be the three reasons I would put forward. Those are ah, excellent. Sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead. A last one, but that's a bonus. If you do a good consecutive, it might improve your simultaneous because you learn to analyze. You listen differently, so it might help. I think it does, actually. Well, Miriam, you should be a teacher, and I think you probably already are. Anyway, you've hit most of the points that I'm uh, going to make myself. Uh, First of all, you need to know consecutive with notes because you run into all kinds of situations where the speaker uh, does not stop, does not remember that there's an interpreter, uh, or doesn't care. He thinks that the people who don't understand his language are not important, 
or perhaps it's all been planned that way. The person, all the people, is going to give a long speech, and the interpreter is going to reproduce that speech. Pedagogical reasons, as Miriam so rightly said, you need, well, I think you need, and uh, many pedagogues think you need, and the, inter and the school where I went to, you had to do a year of consecutive before they let you go into simultaneous, because the theory goes, and I believe it's well-founded, th that when you do consecutive, long consecutive, five, ten minutes, you are forced to, if you do it properly, you are forced to adopt the actual process of interpreting, interpreting. That is, you listen, you understand what the person was really trying to say, the impact, the style, everything, and then you're forced to sort of forget much of the words and what was uh, the form uh, clothing that message, and you find words in the target language that express exactly that message. So you're forced to do what some of us would simply call interpreting rather than doing word for word, which the beginner does. And in simultaneous, we are tempted to do because we still hear the source language word ringing in our ear just a few seconds uh, later when we have to uh, convey that uh, meaning. Of course, good simultaneous is not like that, but attaining good simultaneous is helped a lot by doing good consecutive. And then the third reason, as Miriam rightly said, is that many, most, in fact, as uh, pretty much all uh, major international organizations will have a five or eight or minute consecutive as part of their test to put you on their roster of freelance interpreters or possibly to hire you as a staff interpreter. And not just international organizations, uh, the courts and other entities will often administer a, a consecutive exam with notes. So those are, those are at least three reasons to learn consecutive. We like to emphasize here the idea of deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is, if I'm going to a job and I do my, my you know, day-long job uh, interpreting, uh, of course, that is a form of practice. I'm, but let's compare it to a couple of basketball players. One of these players likes to go and play for a couple of hours. She plays hard, has a good time, and of course, that's a great practice. But the other one does what we're calling deliberate practice, where it's much more methodical, it's more thought out, it's more planned. And what are the, what are the components of this, when this basketball player uh, plays and practices? Well, first of all, she's focusing on a skill. She may go and say, okay, I've already figured out from the feedback I got last time that my uh, jump shot from the right side of the court is, uh, has a very low percentage of making it. So I'm going to do 100 shots like that, and I'm going to have a friend under the uh, basket telling me, okay, you were a little bit too far to the left, a little bit too far to the right. You uh, got this percentage, and uh, so giving me uh, feedback. That's what the basketball player is doing, and that's what we do. We, have, we do uh, a consecutive, and then somebody gives us feedback. And then, and the whole idea also is to, as you've already seen, we, she does, she's chunked it. She's not just playing basketball with all the skills mixed together, which is what we do in our finally final performance, but she's singling out specific skills on the basis of the time before, all the times before when she realized, okay, this is where I have a weak point. So you chunk it into activities and then devise exercises. One of the major points of, um, the deliberate practice is feedback. Feedback, monitoring, self-monitoring, etc. You can monitor yourself. You can have a colleague monitor you like we do here, or you can have an expert. You can have a coach, or if you're in a teacher uh, university program, you can have it. Uh, you can get monit monitoring from your professor. You find out what your strong or weak points are, and then you devise exercises. So here, you can see sort of a triangle that shows what kind of frequency. You should probably have all of these types of monitoring going on, both some kind of coach or expert or professor, maybe giving you feedback once or so a month, maybe a colleague doing it once or twice a week, and then maybe yourself recording yourself, watching your recording, no matter how painful it is, and uh, doing, determining, have I improved? What are my weak points, et cetera? So, and that's what we're doing 
here. When we do our uh, consecutive uh, with a colleague, we sit down, two or three of us, listen all to the same thing. If we haven't got a recording, maybe one of us will give a talk. Best is a talk that's been prepared ahead of time. And we all three or two will take notes. And then one of us will do an interpretation while the other two uh, listen and write on top of their notes, perhaps in another color, comments about the interpretation. And the whole idea is to give feedback, just like the friend under the basket is saying, OK, you missed a little bit too much to the right, a little to the left. Uh, your colleague is going to be saying, OK, what you seem you, you missed this and you missed that, and this is something you need to work on. So uh, this is a little guide about how to critique. When you're listening to the interpreter, please, in your own notes, write on top of what you took the first time when you listened to the speech, what your comments are going to be. If the person says something that you think was wrong, please write verbatim what the person said and you think is wrong because it's not very fair to say, hey, you said something wrong here. I can't remember what it was. Okay, that's better than nothing, but to try to write it down so you can really tell the person exactly what uh, he or she said and be ready to explain also, okay, it's before this, before, after that, so that the interpreter can find it in her notes. Also, I'd like to say that you listen as uh, with two ears. It's a way of saying, it's a metaphor for saying that both you listen just like somebody who did not hear the original. You say, well, if I hadn't heard the original, I don't think I would have caught this point, okay? So you're sensitive to our clients, what they would be uh, hearing because they can't hear the original, they can't understand the, but also you're going to listen to the, with that second ear, which is that of uh, somebody who does understand the original and can give feedback on that basis. So first of all, this empathy with the client, uh, know how the person feels who can't understand the original and give feedback on that basis. And then of course, expert sort of expert help by uh, a colleague who has understood the original. We're going to take a look now at how you would proceed with this feedback. First of all, be kind and useful. The whole idea is to help the person figure out what might have gone wrong. You can often you can tell what was going wrong by uh, you, you notice in your notes that maybe you had the same kind of problem. Um, so try to be helpful and try to do a bit of the diagnosis with your colleague, what might have gone wrong. Start with the general impressions. Let's see if it was smooth, whether it was not longer than 80 or 90% of the original. Your interpretation should be shorter because you are not finding your way. By the way, I should add, you should always practice with speeches that are off the cuff, not written. If you see a recording and you can tell the person is reading, it's usually not a good idea. People who are reading uh, just have a totally different uh, way of expressing themselves. And um, so anyway, people who speak off the cuff are finding their way, sort of like I'm finding my way right now. But as an interpreter, you uh, know the way and you're able to cut out the hesitations, the ticks and things. So in theory, you should be able to do it in a shorter time. You should Pay attention to this. This is something that I neglected in my first year and I had to do a second year all year long of consecutive. You really need to be pleasant, holding attention, smooth, and uh, there's a, it's a performance. And this comes later. Uh, you know, in the beginning, we're hesitating, we're stopping. Uh, but with practice, you need to reach a point where it's fast, it's pleasant, people enjoy looking at you and they do look at you. They, person who just gave a speech does not want the people listening to the interpreter to be uh, bored and looking at their telephones or maybe even leaving the room because the interpreter is struggling, uh, doesn't look sure, etc. It has to be a good, smooth, pleasant performance. Try to use eye contact. That will help you. Not only will that help people be interested in what you're saying, it'll help you because you will feel their need to understand. So when you are giving that critique, yes, I, so I said the first part is sort of an overall impression. And then the second part is we're going to concentrate on substance. Try to pick out three, four, five major points, if there are any, of substance. When we say substance, we mean the content. We mean the actual information. Uh, it's the whole 
uh, you know, the dates, the names, everything, the, ar the arguments, the links, the descriptions, all the, all the information, the message, because it's different from the form. The form is when you say, okay, you got the information and I think the listener understood the information, but there's a better way of saying it. Please always maintain as interpreters these distinctions in your minds. This is going to help you all through your career and especially when you're doing um, critique and doing interpreting. So we are going to go on and actually do an interpretation. We're going to split this into a couple of parts. We are going to do a one uh, as a large group as sort of a demonstration. We'll listen to a, a piece and then we will do another piece which will be, um, we will be broken up into uh, breakout rooms in two persons per room, and you'll all have a chance to interpret and to give feedback on the basis of this first demonstration. Are there any questions or comments on that? Because uh, you guys are expert interpreters and uh, maybe something's not clear. Anything, anything uh, needs to be said about this? Everything good if you're anxious to get going and, and do an interpretation? be put on the spot and have everybody watch you and uh okay we got to get used to that there's a there's a performance aspect there's a, a stage fright aspect and it's by doing it in front of a lot of people that you overcome that although i must say i don't think you never ever really overcome the tension and uh, stage fright and uh fear that you have standing up in front of a bunch of people although you you do get used to it uh for, so let's move on and I'm going to give a, do a sound check. Please get out your notepads. Always have a couple of uh, writing utensils, always at least two. They tend to conk out at the worst times and you want to pick up the second one. And I'm going to tell you actually, this is going to be the, uh, a talk. It's actually the same one as yesterday, but we were not able to actually listen to it. It's about a, a guy, uh, Rutger uh, Bregman, who is a Dutch historian who has a theory about how uh, everyone should have a guaranteed income. And this involves a lot of uh, philosophy. Like, you know, when people, people say, oh, yeah, sure, you give everyone, you know, $1,000 a month, and what will they do? They'll just sit on the They'll, they'll buy drugs or they'll just buy alcohol or sit on the couch and eat potato chips and watch TV. And so that's part of Bregman's main argument is that, well, actually, no, that's a misconception that people are so lazy. Uh, we, we should look at evidence. And so I'm doing this partly to make this more uh, realistic because in fact, uh, whenever you do uh, your work out there in the real world, you will have a chance to think about what the subject is and what the, what's going on. But I also am recommending that when you do your practice, do a little bit of brainstorming beforehand to uh, prepare yourself. You can't, you can't just do anything out of the blue. So what would you expect from this, uh, from this uh, just to get our uh, minds on track? What, what would you expect this to be about? What, you don't need to pull up words, although there may be some technical words. Anybody have some uh, theories? I think he'll talk about the advantages of having a guaranteed income. He will okay. try to pitch it. Okay, good. So, so, right, that's great, because what you've just done is... Um, you've categorized this speech it's going to be persuasion right he is you know sometimes it's a congratulatory speech you know somebody has, has, has wants to uh, congratulate somebody for the, an honor or a, a speech could be a thank you speech or a speech could and we're not just doing speeches i'm using the term speech for any utterance it could be a witness on the on the witness stand it could be uh, technicians just giving a technical description but you've you've given us a good clue there yes it'll be something about persuasion he's trying to persuade people anything anything else 
Oh, uh, I have the volume on maximum. I'm really perplexed. But so what we're going to do, because, you know, uh, the way it was put earlier is, it's true. Uh, interpreters cannot be dedicating all their attention to trying to figure out what's going on. You can't, you can't do a decent interpretation. Apparently, some of you are able to hear pretty well, but uh, we need to be, it needs to be good enough for everybody. So um, what I'm going to do is uh, give a talk myself. And this is the kind of thing that happens it used to happen to me all the time when we were uh, students. Uh, we would come with prepared talks or recordings and we realize it's just no good or something. So it's a good idea to have something in your, uh, in your repertoire. Have a set of presentations in your mind that you can use. What I'm going to do, therefore, is going to uh, give his talk for him. I know that you can hear me pretty well, right? Okay, so here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a wonderful conference. And I would like to know how many of you watch the news every day? I see some hands uh, going up. I see that uh, many of you are watching the news. And how many of you feel that you are brainwashed and led to be somewhat crazy by the news? Okay, I see that there's one person out there who's uh, ad admitting that. What I would like to submit to you the following. The news is not newsworthy. It's not broadcast and it doesn't happen if it's representative of actual life. So if you have 999 people walking down the street, being perfectly civil, going to work, being courteous and excellent citizens, and you have one person who is breaking a window and stealing something that will be in the news the crime will be in the news so when you turn on the news whether radio tv or whatever and what you see is a person breaking a window and stealing something this is going to be part of your perception of reality Yes, uh, intellectually, you know that this is news uh, because it's a little bit unusual. But does your entire subconscious, does your perception of the world take that fully into account? I think actually we're getting a skewed perception of reality when we watch the news. Let me give you another example. In the 1980s, airline accidents were much more frequent than today. They've made enormous progress. The uh, air, airplanes would maybe, airplane crashes out of say, you know, 10,000 10, flights were about 10 times more frequent in the 80s than they are today. The result is that in those days when there was a, an accident, it was frequently not reported at all because it was seen as nothing, particularly newsworthy. Whereas today, when airline accidents have become 10 times more rare, it is reported. And so what happens when we watch the news is that we subconsciously or consciously conclude that airplanes, or we might, you know, sort of feel that airplanes are dangerous Whereas in the 80s, we would not get that perception because there was no news report about airplane crashes. And reality was exactly the opposite. Airplanes are safer today. So that's why I'm asking why many of you, uh, are you aware that you're going crazy? Because crazy means uh, mentally ill. And what is the basis of mental illness? Mental illness is when your representation of the outside world is, does not match what's actually happening. So if you hear voices and there's actually no voice, that's a form 
of mental illness. If you see things that are not there and, or if you are paranoid, for example, and you have uh, beliefs about people wanting to do you harm, whereas they do not want you have no such intention to do you harm, that's a form of mental illness because your representation of what's happening does not actually fit what's happening. So that's mental health is when it does. And so I, I would say that watching the news will tend to make you a little bit crazy. And the way that it makes you crazy is actually quite harmful because it portrays all sorts of negative, violent, uh, bad things. So it is creating a belief in you and in millions of people that people are worse than they really are. Let me tell you another story. And it's in my book called Humankind about, well, another book. It's called The Lord of the Flies. This is an extremely famous book. It was actually, uh, it's been read by school kids all over the world. It's the story of some children who are marooned on a desert island and they are left to their own devices. They uh, end up uh, in conflict. They end up uh, ganging up on uh, one poor guy and they are cruel and they are terrible to each other and they actually end up killing one of the boys. Well, I, uh, Rutger Berg, Bregman, I decided, well, but is this actually realistic? And so I started looking around and what do you know, I found that there is the actual history of seven boys who were marooned on a desert island for one year. And so I thought, hey, here we can compare reality with this fiction, the fiction that has been read by millions and millions of people. And what do you know, these children who marooned, were marooned on an island near Australia actually got along extremely well. They were highly organized. They ended up actually building a fire and maintaining that fire for an entire year. They built a little uh, gym in their camp area. They had a system for collecting water and they even had a system for settling disputes if there was a dispute the two boys uh, fighting would have to go to opposite ends of the island and come back and uh, greet each other uh, courteously the next day. So what do you know? Reality, evidence is saying the opposite of what the fiction said. And when you look at this fiction, well, actually the author, and I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, said, and I quote, I understand the Nazis because I actually am of that sort. Well, what do you know? The author of the book read by millions and millions, which by the way, uh, has created a lot of uh, assumptions about how people are bad. And therefore you would say maybe they would uh, take their $1,000 a month and just use it to for bad effects, we, we, we are consuming fiction and news that's telling us things that are the opposite of what evidence tells us. In other words, that people, a great majority of people are productive and courteous and civilized. And I will now uh, stop my talk because I think it would be time for interpretation. Now, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. And remember, when you volunteer, you have the enormous privilege of, ex of practicing for the big day when you are in front of the UN jury or the State Department jury or the European Union uh, interpreters all staring at you looking very threatening and they're going to judge you. You get to practice that. So. I encourage you to, to volunteer as hard as it may be. Any volunteers? All 
Okay, uh, Dragoslava, I see that you're volunteering, correct? Um, yes, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try. Wonderful, thank you. That's courage. Now, everybody, <laughs> thank you. I, I, I'm sorry, Dragoslava, I'm just going to interrupt you for a sec. Yes. Everybody else, please try to now implement what I recommended earlier, which is that you look at your own notes. Best is to take another pen with a different color. And as she goes through, note what, how you might help her out by saying, you know, you, what you said was this and write it down verbatim. But what I heard is that. <clears throat> okay, so get ready in case you, want, you are going to be doing the uh, giving the feedback. Okay, excuse me, Dragoslava. Thanks That's for right. waiting. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I am um, very pleased to be here um, at this conference um, and talking to you. Um, I have a question for you. Um, how many of you are watching news regularly? Um, I see some of you are, actually many of you are. And so tell me, how many of you feel brainwashed of feel like you're going crazy? Oh, just one? Well, I submit to you that news is not, is only what is newsworthy, not what is actually representing life. Uh, you can have 999 people walking around, um, being courteous to each other, uh, civil, being good citizen, and one of them would be breaking windows and uh, behaving badly. So which one will make the news? Of course, the one who is committing a crime is going to become newsworthy. So we will see on the news uh, people breaking windows and sealing, and we will be led to believe that that is reflecting reality. Uh, because your perception is going to get skewed. You may know that it is not a reality, but seeing it is going to change your perception. Uh, here's another example. In the 80s, uh, the airline safety was much less than it is today, and there were many more airline crashes. There were about 10 times more airline crashes than right now, which resulted in not, in not every one of them being reported. So today, when it is 10 times more rare that an airline crashes, we will hear about every single crash. That may lead us to think that airline security is worse today than it was in the 80s, and it actually is quite the opposite. So, what makes you crazy? What is the definition of being crazy? That is when the, uh, your inside perception of the outside world is not matching the reality. If you hear voices, if you see things, um, if you believe that people are uh, around want to harm you, that would make you feel crazy. So watching the news with all the bad things happening can be considered that it is making you feel crazy. And that would be really harmful for you because it shows the world in negative ways. It shows violence. It shows people behaving badly. So that is going to make you believe that people are actually worse than they really are. Um, I'm going to talk about my book, um, Humankind, in which I am talking about another book, um, a very famous book. I forgot the name of the uh, author. It's um, Lord of the Flies, which is about some children on a um, deserted island left alone for a while, and it re ends up in um, conflict. They are cruel to each other. They are harming each other. They actually end up killing one of the boys. So I, uh, uh, Rutger Bergman, was interested to see if this matches the reality. So I looked around in history and found a real example of seven boys being stranded on an island for a year. Uh, it was an island near Australia. Now, this is history, not fiction. And the boys, turns out, got very well organized. 
they actually were able to make a fire and maintain it for a whole year. They organized the gym uh, to uh, keep themselves fit. They organized uh, how to get the water. They even had developed a system for resolving the dispute. Uh, one of them, one of the offenders would be sent to another part of the island and then um, when he comes back he would be have to be courteous to everybody else so that shows us the reality the evidence we find in reality is actually proving opposite to the fiction of the book i spoke about but when you look at the author of that fiction book which again i'm sorry i can't remember his name the author said that um, he understood the Nazis because he actually was one. So what we have here is the author has created a world where he, because he believed that people are bad and will waste the money, which evidence shows us exactly the opposite in reality, that people in such situations will be productive, they will be um, behaving in a civilized way, and they will treat each other in a courteous manner. And that's thank where you. I end. Thank you, Drogoslava. That's Thank you very much. Thanks for your courage. <laughs> and we will comment on the who would like to uh, give feedback. And again, I'm going to summarize. I'd like to, it to be in three parts. First of all, a general impression. Were people interested? Were people listening? Were people, um, were people going to stay and get, catch the whole thing? Was Dragoslava actually doing interpreting or doing some kind of word for word without understanding? That's point number one. Number two, were there any major points of substance that you could comment on which would enable Dragoslava to improve either her note taking or her listening, or her um, presentation skills. And then number three, <coughs> you, can, you can talk about form. The reason we have talk about form last and try to minimize it is that as interpreters, we've always been working a lot with language and form, and we tend to brainstorm and end up in discussions about words, which is okay. But what, here what we're doing is actually trying to uh, dig into the process of interpreting and note-taking for interpreting. So we separate the two out and sort of mm, try not to spend more than, say, 20% of the time on, you know, the nicer way to say things or the correct way to say things, although that is important. I'm just, I'm just saying it shouldn't dominate. So... So number two was uh, substance, point out points of substance. And then number three, especially if you are a, someone who's got a mother tongue in the target language, you can help the person find the, the best ways to say things. That's what we're calling form, number three. Okay, so who would like to try to apply that method and give some helpful feedback? Uh, put yourself in her shoes. What would you want somebody to tell you about? to improve, to do even a better interpretation next time. Anybody, any volunteers? No? David, may I? Yes, is that Rifat? Yes. Did I this pronounce your name? Rifat, okay, I pronounced Perfect. your name correct? Yeah, okay. Perfect. So um, I, having no experience in consecrative or seminar level interpretations to be amongst you such experienced, highly esteemed uh, people. I feel uh, really uh, blessed. Um, I just wanted to be courageous to say, uh, just try it out uh, to give feedback. So first of all, I think um, Dragoslava, you did a great job and did, I hope I said your name correctly. Uh, your substance was uh, great. The meaning, I think the message was clear. Um, and your form, I, I, was, I was listening to David and you, I think your tone and um, the deliberation was excellent. However, I just, as a beginner, as I was also taking notes, because for me, um, note taking is what I am being trained on. So this is highly important for me. And um, 
just two points. I think uh, one was, and of course, you got a lot more than I did. I was following David's S SVU um, on my notes. I think David mentioned the word in the example safety, but you used probably security. I might be wrong. So safety is a technical term. He was talking about the airline accidents, but security could mean the, you know, these days terrorist attacks and all that. So I'm not quite, this is, um, I heard probably David meant safety meaning accidents, but security might be a different term. Um, and then one other point was David mentioned each of the boys were sent to two locations of the islands. And I believe you said one boy was sent to um, another island. Um, that's, that's all. That's the, those are the two points I could add other than that, it was, I think it was great. Thank you, Rifat. That's beautiful. Thanks very much. I'm going to now comment on the, uh, the feedback itself. Uh, first of all, uh, Rifat, that was excellent. You inverted the order. It doesn't matter that much, but you started with a matter of form. But as an A, you can help her. I think you have an English A, is that correct? What's that? Well, never, never, never mind. Oh, where, where uh, are English. You? Oh, say that again. Sorry. Are you, where are you from? I am from Bangladesh. I was born in Bangladesh, but I'm Bangladesh. here. Oh, I guess that was years. India. Okay. Anyway. Um, no, 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 not India. Bangladesh. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, you made an excellent distinction between uh, safety and security, which uh, in you. many of these other languages are, are thrown together, like in French or Spanish. The security, or seguridad means, can mean both of those. So that was a good distinction. But it was a matter of form, and what I do is recommend putting that last and minimizing it. But, you know, you, you found something, and there's very little to find, so that's great. The thing about the boys. Now, let's... So, of course, Dragoslava is able now to think about this. Hey, okay, that's true. There's not quite the same safety and security. I'm going to remember that. That's the whole idea behind what we're doing here. You want to bring out things and you know it's just like when you learned your foreign languages you you trip you fall and you figure out okay that didn't work why and then the next time you you do it right so that's what we're doing here um now, can i just interject for a moment sure um what may affected me is the fact that the same word is used in my native language for both safety and security right that's what i was saying about french and spanish okay and so the same thing for uh serbian or uh, Serbo Croat, or what is that? What you Serbo Croatian, speak? Serbian, yes. Right. So, but I, I would use the same word in interpretation. So that probably is what. If you were going into your A, go. of course it, it wouldn't matter. If you were going into uh, A, is your your mother tongue. B is a, an active foreign language. And if you were going into a foreign language like English, it would be useful to know this. But it, going into your mother tongue the problem wouldn't have arisen, right? But you learned a point of English there, right? I think that that word caught my, my ears because of my background, because I work for the intelligence community, strategic language. I teach the foreign service officers and uh, uh, other agencies uh, orientation course and the language. But th those two words are so critical because of the terrorist uh, stuff. So that probably caught my attention more. Otherwise, probably it wouldn't even have caught my attention. So. It's, it's an excellent point of uh, English. It's, a, it's super important for the reason you just said, but let's move on. The, the, uh, you mentioned the two boys. Now, the, the whole idea here is to improve. So it's true. As a speaker, I can confirm that there were two boys, not one. So Dragoslava, and this is as a demonstration. I want you all to see what we're doing here. Dragoslava, what happened? Take a look in your notes. First of all, well, take a look in your mind. Did you hear that there, were, there was one boy or two boys? Uh, right now, I don't even know. Okay. I can't even recall. Well, then I'm let's trying assume, to find in my notes. I think that we would, well, if that's what you said, I have an impression that that's probably what you 
deduced from what you heard. So, uh, in other words, that's what you understood. Now, yeah, please do find it in your notes if you can, because that's the whole idea here. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just wrote, go to another end of island. System for dispute, send to another um, end of island. So I did not even note whether it was one or two. I just jotted down that the, the punishment for a dispute would be being sent to another uh, part of the island. Yeah, this, this is a very minor point because in my view, because you got the essential, uh, but, but it was two. So there is uh, a problem. We want to be super accurate. And it was off enough for someone to notice it. And I think people might notice that. It was, it was two. And the, I, how, how would you, okay, I, I, I have a theory about what happened. You were writing and you got the idea that somebody had to go to the, but there was so many more words coming and you're so preoccupied by the next thing you have to write that you didn't really perhaps listen enough to ingrain in your mind that it was both boys being sent to opposite ends of the island. Is that, is that right. possible? I, I was focusing on the, um, the method of punishment. That was where my focus was, writing down that the system for dispute was set so that the offender was sent to be alone on the other end of the island, mull over his behavior. Right. All that stuff was happening in my that's, head. That's so that I, is what I was focusing on that's what, and missed the number of. That's why I say you got the essential because if it was one, one would be sent. If it was two, we can assume two would be sent. So you're getting the essential. However, you in a really, really, really demanding situation, by the way, your interpretation was pretty much professional standard. You would probably pass uh, most exams, in my opinion. So let me just tell you, you. It, it was very good, uh, but it could be better. So I think you would, I'm, so, but the whole purpose of being here is to find out why. And yes. do, do you, because you want to get it next time, right? Right. And so we want to figure out what happened. What is so common is that we, it's just going by too fast and our mind for an instant thinks about the notes and for that instant doesn't focus on what's being said. Do you think that might've right. happened? Right. I was focusing on the process um, and comprehending the process and jotting down the process and not focus on the words um, said. Okay. So let me just reassure Ju you. Judging by the notes. Right. That's, that's what I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's by looking into this that we improve. It's just like when you learned your foreign languages. It's by analyzing, of course, this takes time. It's, it's when you rode a bicycle, when you learned how to drive a car, etc. Same thing. You, you had to decompose right. everything, okay? I yes. have to turn the signal and then turn this, and I have to watch the light going on and off. It's also very complicated. But by thinking it through over and over, it, it, be, it, be, it becomes so familiar and becomes so automatic that it becomes easier. And so that's right. why I want you to go through this analysis. So what happened is you probably suspended listening, listening for an instant. You, you really did catch the, the essence, but there was a small thing that you didn't catch. Now, we want to catch everything. So, right. yeah. So again, it was, it was excellent. But I, I'm, we are doing this as a demonstration. We, want always right. to, we always want to look at what happened. And, and generally what's happening almost all the time as we're taking notes is that we're struggling between part of our minds figuring out what to write and the other part of our mind, our mind is listening. And we're not managing that well yet. And I can tell you it comes with practice. Just like, you know, when you learned English uh, the, to conjugate, I go, you go, he goes, you have to put an S after he goes. Right. You know, the first time you said he go, and then someone says that's not right. And then... And then, what do you know, a few months later, you're just saying it naturally. This is what will happen through this kind of practice. So I wanted to do this demonstration um, of how we go about it. 
I wanted to give you this encouragement about, uh, it's actually largely a matter of practice. It is, there are all kinds of techniques though also, all kinds of techniques about, you know, uh, virtual columns, about writing diagonally, about separating the ideas out and all that. That's something maybe we'll talk about another day. But the main thing for now is practice. Now, if everyone is good with this, we're now going to, I'm going to give another, the follow-up to, to that speech, and we're all going to go into our breakout rooms, okay? So get your pen and paper ready, and when I finish, I will place you all in a breakout room, and you will be with one other person. Please do your interpretation. The other person, please give your feedback. And, you know, this is kind of hard for me to manage because um, there's so many rooms and I'm going from room to room and some rooms take longer. Um, and if you finish and you try to go in the other direction, there's nothing wrong with doing it. So both of you can do the interpretation and get feedback from the other one. Of course, the second interpretation benefits from the first one. So it should be a little bit better, right? So here we go. So there is this assumption that people, if you gave them a guaranteed income, they would waste it. You only appreciate what you uh, work for, supposedly, right? So people say that uh, people will uh, waste it, they'll buy it alcohol and uh, whatever, they will not learn to appreciate the money if they get free money. But let me go back in time because there's actually, behind all of this talk, there is a debate launched long ago, at least in Western society, by two philosophers. One was Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher who and I'm going to boil it down, he would probably say, no, that's, that's way oversimplified. I, I never said that. But it's essentially human beings, when they were in small bands uh, of hunter-gatherers before the pyramids, before civilization, before the agriculture, before standing armies in huge cities, in other words, the noble savage, the natural man was peaceful and inclined to cooperate and work together with uh, his fellow men. Sorry, I'm using a bit of old, old language about using men all the time. It's women. There was another philosopher, Hobbes, an English philosopher, who had the opposite take. Mankind is bad. Mankind is naturally lazy, violent, and greedy. And if left to their own devices, people will fight and destroy each other. It's only thanks to civilization that there is uh, any hope of order and prosperity. And this has been called the veneer theory, uh, which means there is this thin veneer, a thin uh, covering of civilization, which is keeping everything intact. If you stripped away that veneer, if you stripped away this thin cover of uh, civilization and left uh, human nature naked to its own devices, people would be fighting and killing and stealing and be and that you would have mayhem. So you have these two opposite points of view. The, my point of view is that it's somewhere in the middle, but it's actually leaning much more towards uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, because I think that the evidence shows that, as we saw in the case of the boys on the island. And there are many, many other examples. Let me give you another example. When the Europeans discovered well, let me back up a second. Easter Island used to be inhabited. And as we know, there are these huge uh, 
statues on Easter Island. And there's a huge mystery about who uh, created these statues. And up until only a few years ago, the theory was that the people on that island had had a terrible fight. They had become, they had actually chopped down too many trees and so food became scarce and they started warring with each other at opposite ends, had different bands at opposite ends of the island. And they, there were even stories about a mound where the bodies were all buried and it had been a terrible tragedy. And they even had some people trying to pinpoint the year when this took place. And that's how the people there disappeared. They, they actually, they cut down too many trees to create these statues because they would roll them on the logs and they ran out of, of uh, trees and the land became barren. They started to starve and so they all fought each other and they perished. So this is basically the Hobbes view. People are greedy and foolish and they fight and they will, uh, without civilization, they will destroy each other. Well, uh, Rutgert Bregman, I'm gonna speak in the third person now, he did some research and he found out that actually this is not what happened at all. And that story has been repeated from historian to historian, each one quoting the other uh, down through the last few decades. But in the last 10 years or so, it's been discovered that it's absolutely not true. What happened is a slave ship landed on the island, gathered up forcibly all the people, took them to Peru, where they were enslaved and most of them uh, died. So, okay, I'm now going to uh, take a step uh, further in my theory. Now, this is sort of the David Violet theory building on the Rutger Bergman theory. Basically, if you can cover up your crimes by saying it's the people themselves who are bad and they are the ones who are leading to their own demise, uh, not only you come across as innocent, but you come across as necessary. So what I'm saying is the powerful aristocrats and today the, the huge capitalists would say, without us, it would be chaos. We are keeping this veneer of civilization on because people are so bad, they would be at each other's throats if it weren't for the police that we organize and everything organized to suppress human, human beings' violent nature. Whereas in fact, says David Violet, they are organizing everything so that they can get more richer and richer and extract more and more wealth out of those people that they are saying have such an evil nature. So, I will stop now for interpretation. We will break into rooms. Please try to complete your notes um, so that you get the last part. The last part is often a little problem for all of us. You will find yourself, let's see, we are 18, so I'm going to create, uh, that includes me, so I'm going to create uh, eight rooms. Some of you may find yourselves in uh, a room with, with two others, but most of you will find yourselves in a room with one other person. So let's see if I can. And when you see a sign come up saying, uh, come back to the main room, it'll generally say, I think it says in 60 seconds, you'll be automatically put back in the main room. And, um, but just go ahead and come back as soon as you're ready. So here we go. We've got two to most rooms. And please do one of you an interpretation and get feedback. And then if you have time, another do an interpretation and get feedback. So here we go. <clears throat> 